Hello, everybody. This is uh, John Haller with the Prophecy Roundtable. I have with me uh, Tom Hughes. You see him in the lower left-hand corner, Pete Garcia in the lower right-hand corner, and Bridgelette in the upper right-hand corner. And today we're just, I thought it would be a good idea because of some of the, the uh, articles and videos and things that have been posted recently. There will be articles and links posted in the show notes below. And by the way, if nobody could, if somebody would just give me a thumbs up to make sure that you can hear us, that would be great. great. But uh, so we're going to talk about the coming war in the North, and we're going to talk a little bit about the U.S.-Israel relationship in that context. There was the U.N. Uh, fiasco earlier this week. There's been some really troubling things that have happened uh, with things that the uh, o Biden administration is saying, and uh, we're going to do that. So last week, and there, there will be a link to this interview in the notes below. I, I did an interview with Abraham Levine of the Alma Research Institute that's located in northern Israel. It was founded by Sarid Zahavi. And I really would recommend, so for background information, that you listen to that interview with Abraham. And I'm also going to do an interview with him coming up on Wednesday, probably be posted on Wednesday this week. But in that interview, it was very interesting. He's 45. Uh, he's in the Golani Brigade. He's in the reserves. And after October 7th, he was called up on October 8th. He has eight children. He's 45. And he served in the um, in Gaza. And he was making a lot of comments about Gaza. We didn't get to talk a lot about the North yet. But in Gaza, what he said was every home is somehow associated with Hamas or is associated with Hamas ideologically, that they have um, maps in their homes that do not have Israel. They just have Palestine. Uh, the situation in the north is more extreme. In the show notes, there is a link to a JNS video from the JNS YouTube channel. It's seven minutes long. I would highly recommend that you look at that because it will tell you the absolute potential disaster that could face Israel if the war begins in the north, particularly given the sort of uh, tenuous relationship between Israel and the United States right now, which the United States is probably Israel's biggest ally. We supply a lot of their weapons and ammunition stores. And it's just the, the relationship is deteriorating for any number of reasons, in my opinion. And that was manifested this earlier this week at the UN General uh, UN Security Council, where the U.S., for I think only the second time uh, in its history, did not veto an anti-Israel resolution. So when this war starts, the estimates are potentially tens of thousands of casualties on both sides of the Israel-Lebanon and Israel-Syria borders. So, uh, guys, I just want to kind of open the floor to, dis to discuss this. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? What are the things facing Israel? And how do you think it's going to go? And then, you know, kind of build in there how you think it fits into Bible prophecy. That's a lot there, John. Yeah. <laughs> And, and take a minute each to cover all those subjects. <laughs> well, no, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, go, sure, I'll go kick ahead. it off. Well, I, I'll tell you that um, I think that uh, the biggest detractor for Hezbollah right now, uh, the biggest issue that they have is they've lost the element of surprise. So when um, Hamas launched their uh, surprise attack on October 7th, uh, they were able to launch thousands of these Qassam rockets, which were like, short really short range rockets that that are, are all unguided and um they can launch them from like you know uh makeshift launchers and things like that and they're lightweight um, a lot of what hezbollah has in the north in terms of uh missiles and, and mortars and and things um i'd say the bulk of it is in the short range area now they have like for instance they have a ton of mortars 140,000 plus mortars, but that's the, the rounds. I don't know how many mortar tubes they have and or how many people they have to, to man those things, but they only have a range of about 10 kilometers. So um, they would have to really mass their, their uh, mortar teams on the border, which now they can't because of, of the hyper 
vigilance that Israel's under now um, with regards to everything going on in Hamas and and, and all that. So I, I think I think that there is a, a risk with Hezbollah, and obviously they're they're better armed than Hamas's, but they've lost that huge element of surprise. So that's that's really working against Hamas or against uh, Hezbollah now. Okay, Britt, what do you think? Yeah, I would say I think it's it's inevitable that we're going to see this conflict erupt into a, into an all out war because you have over 60,000 residents in northern Israel have been evacuated since October 7th. That can't continue indefinitely. And based on what happened October 7th, the threat of Hezbollah, even without that element of surprise, is greater than what Hamas was. And I don't think that Israel has the mindset that they're going to continue to allow that type of threat to exist on their border. And just because we haven't seen that conflict erupt into an all-out war yet doesn't mean that it hasn't been really inevitable since October 7th. I mean, we look back at, say, World War II, that officially began with the invasion of Poland by Russia, Germany, and you had France and Great Britain declared war a couple of days later. And there was some minor conflict, just as we've seen. There's been well over 4,000 different uh engagements between Israel and Hezbollah since October 7th. But the bulk of the fighting between Great Britain, France, and Germany took place, didn't take place till May, eight months later. So there's a lot of logistics that take place behind the scenes. There's a lot of planning on both sides. And I think that it's inevitable that we're going to see this escalate because again, Israel cannot allow this threat to continue and to con continue to grow and build if they do nothing. And so I think it's it's just a matter of time before we see one side or the other strike. Mm -hmm. Tom, Tom, you were just in Israel. What did what was the thinking there when you were in Israel about the potential for war in the north? Well, you know, I talked with a lot of different people and uh I think what Brit says is really what I came away with. Um, we met so many evacuees at the hotels we were in. Uh, one lady we met was in Tel Aviv. His whole family, her husband had been killed. But they're all evacuated from the north. Uh, in Galilee, Tel Aviv, even in Jerusalem, we met different evacuees. And the same sentiment came from every one of them. We can't, we can't go on like this much longer. They're living in hotels. They have little children. Um, you can tell they're desperate to get back home. They know there's a battle that is being waged. Uh, the other thing, John, I think you and I had talked about a little bit earlier in the week, maybe even last week, was that on the Temple Mount, you know, I was on the Temple Mount. I did a short video up there. It's, it's like the second day of Ramadan, I think, when I was up there. And there's virtually nobody there. And we had several different drivers the whole time in Israel. The majority of them were Muslim. A couple of them were Israeli Jews. But they were all working like they did in years past. They're, 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 they're going back and forth between the Jewish sections, the Muslim sections, just like they always had been. But I really get the sense that what's happening in the West Bank, which I prefer to call Judea and Samaria and, and the area of the Mount Olives, is that they the Muslims know Israel has the upper hand right now with Hamas. They're afraid to do much. But when I, you look at the North, Israel can't continue to live like that forever. And whether it be Iran that decides to pull the trigger or it's Israel that decides, look, we're going to, we're going to step up the uh, whatever we need to do against Hamas because they can't the, – these evacuees can't go back home until this problem is dealt with. And that is a huge problem. And, you know, I, I'll reframe a little bit from what I told my wife last night, but I'm – very blessed that we were able to go have a great time two weeks ago to Israel. But I'm looking at the future and this problem with Hezbollah, to me, in the sense there, is very real. What are they going to do with all these evacuees? What are they going to do with the entire near Northern Territory? If Hezbollah isn't dealt with, they, they can't go back home. They can't go back to living like they want to live. And you look at the biblical timeline of what is coming. We do know that things are going to escalate in the north. Is it going to be now 
or will it be five years from now? But I tend to lean with what Britt is saying. Something's going to happen, and there still is pressure from the internal parts of the West Bank. Um, and then, uh, but I do, th- I do think Israel's going to going to eliminate the Hamas problem as much as humanly possible. The Hezbollah, I think, is a huge problem. Yeah. Well, you know, I when I talked to Avraham last week, um, he painted a picture. You know, I, I listen. We know that God has this plan for Israel, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to discount that or ignore that. But I also am a realist that I live in the real world and I have to look at the things that are going on and the things that we're facing. So I'll just summarize what Avraham said was that this is a very difficult situation. Whatever Israel has faced in Gaza, you could multiply it many times to show what they will do, what they will face in the north. Uh, Sarid Zahavi, who founded the Alma Research Center, and, and the video that JNS put up, the seven minute video, it looks to be a joint project between JNS and Alma. <clears throat> and I've heard Zarit talk and interview, do interviews a number of times. And what she said was this every other home, or at least every third home in southern Lebanon, is associated with Hezbollah. It's owned by Hezbollah. It's a Hezbollah supporter. And whatever they found with regard to the tunnel situation in Gaza, they always assumed that the tunnel situation in southern Lebanon was worse. There's some belief that there are tunnels that go all the way from the Lebanon border to Beirut. And what is that, 30, 40 miles? And they're drilled through bedrock. They're they're much more difficult to deal with than the t- tunnels in Gaza. And when they and when they started the war, they thought, what did they think? Hamas had thirty thousand fighters. Now it's up to forty. They never really give a solid number. I think it's up to forty thousand now. So that Hezbollah has at least fifty thousand regulars and probably double that that serve or have served in the Syrian war. And we're not, and we haven't even talked about the Syrian part yet. And I want to be sure we talk about that. So don't let me forget. But he said, Abraham said, I said, so what does this mean? He goes, right now, the people from the north have evacuated 60 to 80,000. They don't have schools for the kids. They don't have jobs. They're living in hotels. They don't know what the future is. Some of them are starting to say, we're never going back. And Zarit Zahabi says, we can't live like this. Something has to be done. And what Hezbollah has done is sort of created a artificial buffer zone inside Israel, as opposed to a buffer zone inside Lebanon. And the people are there. And I said, but what happens if the war starts, Avraham? And he said this, no child in Israel will go to school for at least a year anywhere in Israel, all the way to a lot. And that's a pretty sobering thought because when those rockets start flying and they have much more, you know, they have probably 10 times the amount of rockets that Hamas had, and a lot of them are precision guided, it's going to be a very difficult situation. So what, what I guess, what are the prophetic implications of that? What do you think? Anybody? Well, well I'll, I'll speak up. I think that, you know, what you're, what you're talking about, when we look at the situation that's going on now and say this can't continue with this displacement, and then you talk about what the implications are once this, I believe it's inevitable because of that displacement that this conflict takes place. What are the implications? Like you said, a kid's not going to school for a year. I don't think you can have a protracted conventional war that goes on because it, you had the potential for loss of power and water in Israel from some of these rocket attacks. I think you're, get, you're gonna see Israel use absolute overwhelming force. And so I think the, pot, the clear prophetic implications from my standpoint, I know not everybody uh, believes this, but 
is Isaiah 17 and the destruction of Damascus. I think we're going to see an out, outright it, major war, all the force that Israel has in order to eliminate once and for all the immediate threat on its borders. Because if they don't do that, it is a clear existential threat to Israel. You can't continue to have a barrage of rocket attacks, not just from Hezbollah, but also from Yemen, from all, all over the place. There's Syria, Iraq. You can see rockets launched from all around Israel continuously. And to have this bombardment and to be living day to day, that cannot continue on and you have a functional society. At some point, just your whole society and your economy breaks down. And then you have to wonder, are you a state? You may not, you may have people there. You may have, it may not be a conquered land, but at some point, if it's, if, if day-to-day -day life is unlivable, then what do you have? And so I, th I think that's the existential threat to Israel that they are going to deal with, with, with overwhelming force, with every everything they have at their disposal. Yeah, I, I agree with Britt. I think that um, they're going to make an example of uh, of the north, whether that's um, carried out in Damascus or it's hitting uh, places within Lebanon proper. But I, I think that they're, they are they they consider the north a, a much more serious threat than they ever did for Hamas, which may have been to their detriment but but now that this all this has happened since october the 7th i think they're hyper vigilant i think they are looking at a worst case scenario with hezbollah and i think they're going to use uh, overwhelming force so what that looks like it could be some type of weapon of mass destruction on damascus which triggers all the chemicals and biological stuff that's underneath the city and in their own tunnels and stuff that they've been storing there for decades um, and at that point, Hezbollah may say, hey, oh, we give up, <laughs> you know, that may be a, it may be over before that starts. But uh, if not, then I think that they could continue that that uh, massive destruction against them as well. So, um, yeah, there, I don't I don't see another like Gaza operation in the north. I think it's going to be very different. And I think once they are done uh, cleaning up in Rafa. Um, they'll be able to move all those Iron Dome batteries. They've already got Iron Dome batteries up in the Golan Heights, but they'll be able to move the bulk of them back up to the north. And then inside of the uh, Iron Dome, they'll have uh, David Sling, and then they'll have Arrow 3, and then they'll have Patriot batteries everywhere. So um, if it's any uh, indication of the accuracy of the missiles that Hezbollah threw in 2006, uh, they were at about a 23% accuracy range in terms of hitting populated areas. Um, so most of their most of their uh, conventional missiles or short range missiles are going to be unguided. Um, they do have obviously uh, they have about five thousand uh, guided missiles, whereas Hamas didn't have any, to my knowledge. Um, so they do th there is that threat there. <clears throat> but I think if if uh, Israel really uh, does this quick and does this very hard, I think they can neutralize the threat uh, in the north. Well, when you say neutralize the threat, do you mean eliminate it or just sort of tamp it down? Eliminate it. Okay. And what do they do about the tunnel situation, Pete? How do, how do they handle that? I mean, I don't think they've got control of that down in Gaza. I mean, uh, the, the guy I interviewed, Avraham, he oh. said, you know, you, you clear an area in 20 minutes you, later, you go back and somebody's popping up out of the ground throwing RPGs at you. So you may control the surface, but you don't control the underneath part. True. Um, they, you know, I, I look back to World War II, and when we uh, decided to drop uh, the bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we didn't need to do that. But when we did that, that was that was enough for them to surrender that day, um, and, and they didn't want any more. So it may be that they make an example out of Damascus. Uh, because they know that at some point they're going to have to deal with the Syrian issue as well. And in this process, they may kill two birds with one stone, kind of, so to speak. But um, I, I don't know necessarily what to do with the, the tunnels itself. But here's where Hezbollah's, their, their strengths are, is in their manpower. So you said 40,000, and I had heard, read estimates somewhere between 30 and 50,000 fighters. 
uh, active fighters. So somewhere in that neighborhood, their strength is in their in their infantry, and it's not in their their infantry is not going to have the same advantage that Hamas had on October seventh because they've lost that element of surprise. So they're not going to just be able to stream across the borders. What their strength is going to be in and drawing the Israelis and the IDF into Lebanon, where the Hezbollah guys are now fighting on their own turf, their own uh, you know ragged uh, uh, landscape, and they're familiar with, and that's where their tunnels are. So. Um, I don't know that, you know, Israel obviously learned a lot of lessons here with Hamas, that their tunnel networks are far more extensive than they had previously believed and far better equipped and wider. I mean, you could drive vehicles through there and everything. So um, they may be developing some type of um, uh, technology now that can just neutralize that as well. I know we have bunker busting uh, type missiles and things like that, but here's the advantage the IDF has in all this, that we don't, they don't have... The, all these hostages that Hamas has. So right now they've been having to fight Hamas kind of with one hand tied behind their back because they didn't know where the hostages were. Um, but with Hezbollah in the north, there isn't any. Um, so they can just pound these things into to, tomorrow and <laughs> um, not not lose sleep over it because they're not killing their own citizens in the process. Well, I would think you could probably flood them too, which is something they've talked about with Hamas. But for the reason you just stated, hostages you don't want to flood out hostages so there's there's a number of things that you could do when you have the the willingness to do it when you when you make that decision that we don't care about the the implications diplomatically and within the media that uh, I think Israel has the upper hand. They just haven't gotten to that point yet where they're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve victory. Or, yeah, new, neutron bombs would do it too. That would that would leave infrastructure in place, but it would suck all the oxygen out of the, it would kill everybody in the tunnels if they were to, to hit it strategically in the right places. In case the people that are watching uh, don't know, there's an article from the Begin Sadat Center about uh, discussing the Samson option, which is the use of uh, nuclear weapons. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes after this is over. But it's a very difficult situation to do. I mean, if you if you think public opinion has turned against Israel, now what happens if they drop a tactical nuke someplace? I mean, what Tom, what do you think is going to happen in that situation? I think Israel has... Is already on the the definite definite declining side of public opinion, and I also look at Iran and thinking, well, now's a great time for them to strike. While anti-Semitism is so significantly high that you know it's like they're in a win-win position in a sense. Um, but when I look at the biblical implications for what's coming, at the same time, I. I I do think Israel has to do something. I believe, like Pete, that uh, Hezbollah is going to be neutralized. I think the problem there with the tunnels is way bigger than uh, Israel estimated pre-October 7. Not just with Gaza, but they obviously underestimate, underestimated Hamas. If they did that, how much have they underestimated Hezbollah also? So that's a huge factor. The other thing is when you look at Isaiah 17 and Damascus, we know Damascus gets leveled in a night. Uh, in the evening, there's trouble. In the morning, she's no more. But there's also, my interpretation of Isaiah 17 is that Israel takes some rather significant casualties in their northern territory. So as we see things develop, everything is going the way that we read about in the news as it works out biblically. The other thing to keep in mind when you enter into the Ezekiel 38 war, well, these territories are, these people groups are non-existent. You don't read anything about the area of Hamas with Gaza. You don't read about Lebanon being involved. You don't read about uh, the, the uh, those different threats with Ezekiel 38. So my guess is they are going to be eliminated uh, at least to the point where they're going to be totally ineffective. So I think Israel is going to be doing something rather significant. They're going to have to, whether it's preemptive by them or Iran does something. But you also look at the nuclear threat that's coming from Iran. Israel has to act. They're, they're already hated by much of the world. I mean, they're hated by churches. They're hated by universities. 
so it's like how much more the anti-Semitism is going to be exposed if they go and do something rather huge in the Northern Territories. So, so I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see, and again, going back to the earlier point about the evacuees, how long can Israel go on like this? So something's going to have to be done. And I don't think it's going to be in the, uh, in the too distant future. Um, I, I can't imagine this going on a year just like it is right now. Tom, I, I got a text this morning from um, our friend Roddy, who lives in the old city. And he said that uh, today was Ramadan, Friday of Ramadan, one of the weeks of Ramadan. And that things were very, I think there was 120,000 people at the Temple Mount today, and things were pretty peaceful. Um, I think you and I talked earlier this week that maybe at least right now, what Israel has done in Gaza has sent a message to people that, you know, you, you better behave. Do you think there's any validity to that thinking? Yeah, I, I do. And but, but, but when you look at Iran, plus if you look at it this way, Hamas is an asset of Iran. Hezbollah is. Mm -hmm. The Houthis are. They're all assets of mm -hmm. Iran. So Iran knows they've lost Hamas. So how much do they want to risk losing Hezbollah? I mean, they lose Hezbollah. Iran has a huge problem. So it, Iran has to, you know, look at this rather strategically and, and work through that process. So, but yeah, I think that's why you don't have these uprisings at the current time in the West Bank or in a, a Mount of Olives area, the, the Temple Mount area, is because Israel is is rather decisively dealing with the Hamas problem. And I do believe there it's just a matter of time, probably not a long time, before they come out uh, victoriously, much to the chagrin of the world's, the world's thoughts towards Israel. But, you know, as you start looking at the Hezbollah problem, yeah, I, I don't think Iran wants to lose that asset. But at the same time, the, you, know, you, know, you strike while the iron's hot, and Israel can't. There's no way Israel cannot continue to live like they are with that threat from the north. They just can't. So I think that factors in Isaiah 17 in in the not too distant future. I I think the an interesting thing is that you know we 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 talk about Israel, the problems for Israel and people leaving the north. But it's also true that in the south of Lebanon maybe double the amount of people who fled the north in Israel have fled the south of Lebanon. And that's Le the Lebanese, well, assuming that Lebanon still exists as a country, as an entity. Um, do, you, do you think, I, and I have some friends who have different ideas on Psalm 83. Psalm 83. One, one of those theories would be that Psalm 83 sort of shows an alliance of countries that will be entered into sort of a peace agreement a peace situation with Israel. Well, right now, some of those countries, some of those areas, which would include Tyre and Sidon, there that that's Hezbollah, and Gaza, of course, is Hamas. But if Israel defeats these people decisively, do you think that people that are left might say, "Hey, you know, we need to go along with Israel," and that will sort of reinvigorate things that people were talking about just. 10 days before, you know, a week, two weeks before the October 7th invasion, Benjamin and not Netanyahu, who's at the UN saying we're on the verge of a new Middle East. But that didn't quite turn out the way that I think he was thinking about at the time. But uh, I mean, what do you think that that what what would what would happen if Israel actually is successful here in eliminating the threat, as Pete put it? Um, do you have anybody you want to answer that? Any, all of you, any or all. <laughs> or I'll, I'll throw something real quick because I just talked for like five minutes. So I'll make this quick. But Israel eventually has to get to a place of some type of peace uh, for Ezekiel 38 to be fulfilled. Uh, we know twice in Ezekiel 38, Israel's living in security. Well, that could that could equate to the IDF you know, keeping them secure in that sense. 
when I was there last week, it was totally peaceful. It was great, just like it's always been. But the one one of the verses in Ezekiel 38 says, it'll be a peaceful people. And that word peaceful is the Hebrew word meaning tranquil. And Israel is nowhere near that place right now. So something has to take place where there is some type of tranquil state where Israel's guard is down. Will it be what you said, John? That, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to talk about because it could be just, I mean, what else are the people who are left after Israel decimates them? What are they going to do? I mean, you look at the Old Testament times, the people decided we better get along with Israel during the time of David. So you start looking at this, it makes a lot of sense what you just said, that those people will want to live in peace. So I'll stop there. Okay, Pete, Britt, what are you guys saying? Well, I'll, I'll say from a Psalm 83 standpoint, again, just like Isaiah 17, there's a lot of debate over what that means. I believe those are prophetic in nature, pointing to this time period. If you read Psalm 83, verse 13, it's a prayer of, Lord, do these things to our enemies. And when you read Isaiah 17, verse 13, it's the Lord saying, I'm doing those very things to your enemies. So it's almost word for word. It's Zach, Zach one verse over another. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, yes, this is most likely, this is the highest probability means by which Israel reaches that tranquil period that Tom mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it probably is likely to lead to some sort of short-term peace that Israel's immediate enemies make with Israel. Yeah, the, I think when you look at it, most nations that have committed um, a significant uh, overwhelming victory or a significant attack that, that is you know, uh, utterly destructive in, in whatever their goals are, whether that's the United States or, or at the end of World War II, or if you look at um, other nations, I think there's a sense of... Um, uh, guilt, collective guilt or national guilt that you use so much force that you're willing to um, really be the the lead champion in peace efforts because <laughs> now you're like, I, I've just I've just done a bad thing, you know, and it's 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 common nature. It's common in human nature for us to want to feel like that. Um, so I do feel like this this attack on Hezbollah and this threat in the north and presumably <laughs> Damascus will be so overwhelming that at the end of that. Israel will be in a position to say, okay, all right, all right, we, um, not, not, not a mea culpa, but, you know, hey, we are ready for peace now. We're ready to really get serious about peace. Now these threats are gone in the immediate area. And I think it does have a, a chilling effect on all these other uh, groups that might have decided to rise up and now they're not. And um, that still leaves Iran, but Iran now is still, uh, you know, bound by the, the tyranny of distance being as far away as they are, and that that ultimately will feed one day into the God make God coalition. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit. I don't know if you guys had a chance to review this article. Let me pull it up here on the screen. An article by uh, Yaakov Lapine in uh, JNS on March 21st. Hamas attack is a weapon of mass distraction is Iran nuke program advances. Let me just summarize the article very quickly for everyone. And again, there'll be a link in it to it in the show notes. And the, the what what Lapine says is that Hamas did this attack, and they they may have gone too quickly. They may they may have acted outside their authority from Iran, but that Iran, you know, Israel's bogged down a little bit in some respects with Hamas and Gaza. It's still not finished. It's been months now. But everybody, I think, that was realistic knew it was going to take a long time to eradicate Hamas. That was the most deeply entrenched terror organization ever anybody's faced in history. That that was going to take time. But that then we have sort of the low-level attacks coming from Hezbollah. I mean, my, my Red Alert app goes off all the time with regard to attacks from the north. I mean, there was a bunch this morning. Every morning, every evening, there's some. And there's been a 
I think close to 400 Hezbollah fighters and commanders Commanders. killed since October 7th, which is almost as many as they killed in the entire six-week Second Lebanon War back in 2006. And we don't even know about it. It's just not talked about that much. So Lapine thinks that the low-level warfare going on with Hezbollah is a distraction to allow Iran to finish up its nuke program. And let's assume that they are doing that in the background. What are the implications for that? How does that relate to some of these prophetic passages? And how does Israel deal with that particular threat, assuming Iran makes advances and finishes up its, its some of its nuclear weapon program? I feel like I feel like a lot of what uh, Brits talked about over the I don't know since like 2017 with the evolution and and exponential evolution in technology that at a certain point um, I mean obviously I think Israel if you remember back to 2016 when Netanyahu's uh, I guess it was 2016 when he's in uh, the uh, United Nations and making the case against Iran and and they were only weeks away or months away. They've been saying that for a number of years, and it seems like they've been weeks or months away since the early 2000s. And but I think at a certain point, um, technology is going to nullify the idea of uh, a nuclear weapon making you a, a a you know a global threat or a global you know serving as a global deterrent because of the nature of artificial intelligence, the nature of swarm and drone technology and all these things that can quickly disable nuclear systems. Um, I I don't know if Israel is kind of looking at it from that light saying, okay, well, yeah, they are advancing in this, creating a nuclear bomb. I think North Korea has like 50 nuclear bombs. Um, But when you stack them up against, say, the the Russia or China or the United States, I mean, it's really nothing in comparison to those. But even, even aside from the nuclear uh, threat itself, there is systems and AI and other things that can be used as weapons that will disable that way ahead of time. So I don't know. I, I, maybe Israel's got it like an evolving uh, mindset about this. Yeah, I would. I would say, you know, from the implications of Iran and their involvement, I go back to what Tom was saying and build on that a little bit. But so Hezbollah is an asset to Iran to A, engage in a proxy war against Israel with and, and be able to have plausible deniability and say, well, that wasn't us that did that, that was Hezbollah. But they've put a lot of effort into equipping, training, funding, providing intelligence to building up this massive army in Hezbollah. I don't think they're gonna stand by and watch that get destroyed. So there's going to be some sort of reaction from Iran in the event that Israel attacks. You also have to look from the standpoint, well, if they're sitting there and saying it's inevitable that Israel is going to attack Hezbollah, perhaps we should preemptively strike and have Hezbollah. Because as you mentioned, the same issue with displaced people is going on in Lebanon as well. And Hezbollah, in addition to being a terrorist organization, is also a political organization. And they want to have public opinion in Lebanon in their favor. So there's pressure on them as well. And that's why I think this this is inevitable. You can't have the current uh, status quo go on indefinitely with these displaced people in northern Israel. And so Sooner or later, this is going to come to a conflict. The question is, what happens as a result of that? And as part of that paper you sent, one of the things they mentioned was <coughs> that Israel very well may use that conflict as a reason to attack the nuclear capabilities of Iran in tandem with a conflict with Hezbollah. And then again, what what are the implications? What is Iran going to do? I don't think they're going to sit back and just let all of this happen. They may not even strike Israel directly, as we've seen with what's going on in the Red Sea. They could do something similar in the Persian Gulf. And again, God, global public opinion in their favor. Well, we're being attacked unjustly because we we weren't involved in this. This was Hezbollah. But, you know, we're going to shut down the Persian Gulf out of protest. 
and put pressure on the entire world in terms of access to oil, because oil prices would just double, triple, quadruple at that point. It's it's hard to say, but I think that um, there's no way that there's a conflict between Hezbollah and Israel without Iran having some sort of major counter offensive, whether that's through means of the Persian Gulf or a direct strike. And I think that there's no way this conflict isn't inevitable. I think that was set in motion on October 7th for the reasons we cited earlier. Yeah, Rand's been pretty good at, you know, we'll fight till the till the last drop of blood of the last dead Hamas individual. They don't usually put their people out front, although Israel takes out their commanders and leadership in Syria all the time. Let me, I want to show you one quote from this article at JNS. Um, it says here, here, this is a guy, a, a security guy named Nagel, Yakov Nagel. Nagel. It says, meanwhile, Russia recently set up military positions in southern Syria near Israel. While Nagel, that's a security expert from Israel, a retired guy, doubted that Moscow posed any current operational threat to Israel, he added that Jerusalem must be cautious about future potential Russian assistance to Iran's nuclear program, which could be given as repayment for the Iranian supply of unmanned aerial vehicles and missiles to Russia's war effort against Ukraine. Nagel said, I hope the Russians do not do this, but it can happen. We are talking about knowledge in the nuclear field. How do you think that fits into some of these, if you think it fits into some of these prophetic passages? Tom? Yeah, I mean, well, we know from Ezekiel 38 that it's just a, a matter of time before Russia and this coalition that includes Iran and Turkey, they're going to come, they're going to invade from the north. And John, I think you and I speculated on this the other day. I, You know, you look at technology and what could happen to Iran. When we have this invasion from the north, the, the Ezekiel 38 invasion, right. it appears there's a ground invasion, but also something coming from the air and because there, you have horse and bucklers. What's that referred to? Do we take this passage literal? And then also when it says they're going to be coming upon them like a cloud, that is, is that drone technology? You know, when we start working this out, where, where's all of this going? Uh, when we start thinking about the technology and what is Israel doing about it? I'm, John, when I was in um, Israel, it was a couple of years ago, we went to the bullet factory. I don't, did you ever go to the bullet factory? No. Uh, it, it is, it's amazing. It's at a time it was designed, it was a kibbutz, a working kibbutz. And it was during the time when uh, England said, the Brits said, hey, we're not going to give you any ammunition. Israel wasn't going to have it. So this is way back, what, 1940, whatever. You're not going to have any ammunition. Uh, and there had all this pressure from England. Well, what they did is they, they, they made their own ammunition in a kibbutz. They had dug out an entire underground area. They built a what appeared to be a laundromat over it for the kibbutz. It worked on hydraulics. This thing was crazy, John. You, you, you need to visit it sometime <laughs> because... When Israel's supply of, of of ammunition was cut off, they had to figure out something else that they could do. I look at that. It's worth visiting anybody who goes to Israel to check it out. But I look at that, and you look at what's going on right now with pressure from the U.S., threats of not being having weapons, threats of not having ammunition, the advancement of weapons, in, or what's going to go on with nuclear technology, or what, what both Brit and Pete were saying, as we look at technology in general, will it be nuclear? Will it be something else? What is out there that's already been developed that we have no idea yet, that hasn't been publicized? Sorry. And then you look at this article that this guy writes about that you just quoted, Yagov Nagel. Um, is Russia a threat or will they be a threat? We know they're going to be a threat. What is Israel doing to prepare for that, that ultimate threat? Are they not just telling us, you know, just like their nuclear capabilities? They obviously don't make those public, right? Um, but you start looking at this and go, okay, what, what are some of the underlying things 
that that uh, that hasn't been publicized by even by Iran. You know, I mean, look what happened with October 7. Hamas was able to pull all of that off, this surprise. So I, I look at the whole thing, very interesting. We know Russia is going to be involved. And I do believe technology is going to be, uh, the, the technology is being advanced that we aren't even aware of yet in weapons that are going to be used in these, in the very near upcoming battles. So Pete, let me ask you a question. And Britt, maybe you can weigh on, on this too, because these are just sort of reports, things that I've seen Thanks, today. Bro. I, you know, I get these, uh, hey, you need to invest in this type thing, this defense contractor. And one of the ones I got, and and Britt, I think I've heard you talk about this, and I think Pete also, about, um, you know, a project from the Defense Department to really develop things quickly. And part of that was on drones, but part of that was on hypersonic missiles, but then today I read a report that's like the U.S. is sort of dropping its hypersonic missile thing because it's not working. I mean, what, what do you guys know about that or what's your input on that? Because I do think it relates to what's going on in Israel and Russia and Iran and every other theater of war that's developing around the world at the moment. Well, I, I can't speak to the hypersonic issue. I've not read up on the, I know the, what the U.S. had attempted to do. It's, it had uh, had some failures in the past. We know Russia is using them or has used them in Ukraine. And uh, so Russia, I guess, is probably leading the uh, world in that type of technology. Um, but I think what you're referring to being able to, pr to produce things very quickly is that the molecular manufacturing, Brit, that, that uh, you've talked about quite a bit. Yeah, there back in back in August, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense came out and announced something called the Replicator Initiative, where Excellent. they had an 18 month goal for the Department of Defense to be able to field uh, sea based, land based, and air based drones in, in the hundreds simultaneously in a conflict. And so, as you see things moving forward. And as we've seen in with Israel, Hamas, as we've seen with Russia, Ukraine, the battlefield is absolutely being transformed by drones. And right now, drones are in the very earliest stages of their development for what the capability will be. And so for, when you look at traditional defense contractors in the United States, where you have these 10, 15 year programs, and we're going to develop this multi-billion dollar weapon system, We've seen what a failure that's been in those conflicts and how quickly uh, inexpensive drones can just eliminate some of those expensive weapon systems. So there's going to be, and there is a move toward investing in low cost drones and drones as munitions and really putting your emphasis in building the software and the AI and then the manufacturing capability to drive those costs down and to be able to create those on the battlefield in the area of conflict. <laughs> so that, for instance, imagine what we see going on in the Red Sea and, and, and imagine if you had the ability to create a swarm of a thousand drones controlled by AI, so it acted in a swarm much like a swarm of bees would, and they descend on an enemy, and then you can create in almost real time in a matter of hours another swarm to follow that up in case that first swarm is somehow defended against. And then you would, these swarms would be, you know, be controlled by AI and be learning on the battlefield. They learn about the defensive measures that were deployed against them, how to adapt against those, how to get around those defensive measures. And so this is what we're headed toward that's really going to transform the battlefield. And in a matter of years, it's going to uh, make, as Pete was mentioning, mutual assured destruction is going to become obsolete because uh, nuclear weapons, as we know them, are really conventional systems in a similar way. And all that keeps, keeps that going is really, I believe, the underwater nuclear capability and not knowing where those are located but we're already seeing France started developing uh, drones underwater for uh, just a specific area. It's meant to go around 
particular ships and they use a acoustic signature to listen for enemy vessels. And so imagine as these drones get smaller and that manufacturing capability comes along, you would be able to deploy these. And I believe this, you would need molecular manufacturing to drive the cost down low enough to do this, but you could deploy those all over the world and every, the depths of all the oceans. And it would be like flipping a light switch. You would be able to see everything that's in there. And then imagine deploying weapon systems that are mimic a school of fish, except again, they're drones as munitions as we're seeing on the battlefield. What would a nuclear sub, how would it combat a school of fish that can just swarm it and destroy it? And so, so, so Brett, that's where we're headed. I think there's been some hope though that this laser things like Iron Beam in Israel and some other laser systems would be able to take out the drone swarms. But I, I have an opinion on that. But what do you, what do you think? Do you think that well, the laser yeah, technology heard, is going to develop to be able to, to take out all these drones? Yeah, the, the common arguments I've heard against this is lasers and EMPs and having these directed energy weapons. The issues with that is, okay, what's your range? And so like on a laser, if you miss, <laughs> what are you hitting on the other side that maybe is an asset to you so, somewhere else? Also, you know, when you right now, maybe a laser works in the Red Sea when you've got five drones coming at your warship. What happens when there's 50,000? You have 50,000 lasers you can shoot at once. Right. Um, as far as an EMP, Again, there has to be a range on that. And so if you fire this, you know, electromagnetic pulse, okay, well, you don't want it to go on forever because again, it could take out some of yeah, your assets. So let's say you limit it to a mile. Well, as I talked about before, artificial intelligence is gonna adapt to that and it's gonna go, hey, we're gonna get hit one mile from here, stop short of one mile and then fire a projectile toward that target that won't be incapacitated by the EMP. I mean, it's there's going to be the, again this lasers. I think is more of the the mindset of these conventional systems that aren't going to be adapted and evolving on a monthly, weekly basis, the way drone swarms are evolving, and so they're going to be left behind. I think I don't think those are going to be adequate defenses. Pete, what do you think? You're a military guy. Well, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think what I've been speaking to is the shift in the mindset within um, the DOD into going into this mosaic warfare model to move away from the conventional systems where you have a standalone tank, a standalone piece of artillery, a standalone helicopter. You want everything synced together. So you basically have three components. You have a decision maker and whether that's a person or that's an AI system, you know, you have the uh, the sensors that are going to be arrayed throughout the battlefield, and I would even say uh, the way that that smart devices are going now, they could actually actually serve as sensors. So if you look at a city, and then you have a drone flying overhead, and whether it's a human or it's a a some kind of AI system controlling the drone, it's going to be able to see everybody with smartphones, for instance, in their pockets. And it can it can quickly be able to to pull the information from that phone and say, okay, yeah, this is civilian, 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 or oh, this guy is a high ranking target. Boom, and then it could direct the executor. So that executor could be a an attack helicopter. It could be a drone. It could be some type of directed energy weapon from a shot from a satellite. I mean, who knows? Um, but that's the shifting nature of warfare, and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier with regard to. So if Iran gets a single, say, let's say they cross the threshold and they are able to make a nuclear bomb, um, even if they could do that, they still are not going to be able, you still have the tyranny of distance of having to be able to launch that thing from 700 miles away and hit it somewhere in Israel um, that, that would affect what you want it to affect without destroying the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The, I mean, they may, they may aim for Haifa, they may aim for... Uh, Tel Aviv, um, but even still, I mean, Israel's so narrow. <laughs> I mean, you're going to take out a lot of. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I just think that technology. Let's say go back to 2016 or earlier 20 when Netanyahu was speaking at the United Nations. His 
uh, you know, saber rattling to get the, the world to wake up to the threat of a nuclear armed Iran is was legitimate at that time. But as that threat shifted, because now technology has moved so far <laughs> past where um, a single conventional um, uh, ICBM uh, uh, with a nuclear warhead on it, a nuclear payload is not the greatest threat anymore. But I, I don't think that they're going to let Iran keep going in that direction. I think they're going to find a way to cripple that. Can, but can nuclear weapons be miniaturized to, you know, be delivered by a yeah. drone? Is that technology available? I hope not, but yeah, I don't probably know. Probably like a, a dirty bomb type scenario. Right. But like a right now, um, Iran is providing Hezbollah their drones. They have a uh, Abibel II and a Mohar here. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, but the Abibel II has got a range of 93 miles, so... Uh, even if they tried to launch it from, I mean, they'd have to get pretty close to the border to get it into Israel, uh, the center of Israel. Let's say it's a, some kind of a dirty bomb. And it can carry about up to 100 pounds, I believe. Okay. So um, I don't okay. know. I mean, so it, we, it, we, we said we were going to keep this to about an hour. So a couple things. Tom, I want you to dress up, and this comes up every time Ezekiel 38, 39 comes up. Is red that heifer? it had well no well <laughs> we can go we have, we can get off on the red heifers too in a moment but the Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine is only at the end of the millennium. What say you in response to that? I know what your response is, but go ahead. Yeah, I I don't see how people come to that conclusion. I mean, the, the, what they do is they jump to Revelation chapter twenty and they take that uh, oh. the gog from. Yeah, Revelation chapter 20, and they conflate it with Ezekiel chapter 38. They're clearly not the same thing for various reasons. One of them is that the territories where the battle of Ezekiel 38 comes from are listed. And the territories of the battle of Gog from Revelation chapter 20 is also listed. And that's the entire globe, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 30 is localized and also the way I look at the 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 this gog is this spirit entity that is really in charge of this this territory as you have the gog magog invasion gog being the one who is going to be the one leading the the what I believe Russia uh in the gog magog invasion but it's a spirit entity is the way I look at it but but again it's the territories it's global in Revelation chapter 20. It is not global in Revelation chapter, in, in Ezekiel chapter 38. And there's several other things that you can also make a clear distinction. I'll even throw this out there. I believe you can do the same thing. I, no, I better not. I'll open up a can of worms and we won't get out of this if I say the next thing. Okay. <laughs> I, there's one thing I want to address briefly. I'm going to address some of these issues in my update on Sunday. But even I'm not going to be, a, as as Britt knows and Pete and Tom know, when you start addressing these issues, it's very easy to go down about 18 rabbit trails very quickly and eat up all of your time that aren't relevant. But I want to raise one issue because the U.S. has come out today or within the last 24 hours, there's a suggestion that yeah. the U.S. would fund a peacekeeping uh, force in Gaza to handle things there to get that stopped. Uh, just give me, guys, give me your quick input on that. What do you think of that? And where is that headed? And how does all that fit into this uh, thing? And I may just save my comments for my update on Sunday. We all have to listen to it then. But what do you think about this? The U.S. funding a peacekeeping force for Gaza. I think it has big implications, but go ahead. Who's first? Well, me, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I think it would be a mistake. I don't think strategically Israel is going to go down that path. As I stated at the beginning, I think that they're facing an existential threat and they're going to eliminate these threats on their immediate borders. And, you know, the United States can protest against that all that they want, but I don't think Israel has a choice. And so that's what I think is going to happen. Yeah, I think um, I think that the U.S. Uh, may want to do this, but uh, the actuality of it, it, I mean, with it actually being carried out, I don't think whatever would ever take place. For one, it's it's directly um, contrasting or contradistincted 
from what Netanyahu has said, he doesn't want that. Um, he's already laid out his plan for post uh, Gaza operations. Um, but secondly, I think that if that were to be the case, I think that the, the U.S. and whoever else is involved in this would find themselves embroiled in all sorts of other issues that are that all of a sudden become way more problematic for them. And that becomes something that just gets, uh, you know, put to the curb, so to speak. So just like Gaza and Hurricane Katrina kind of situation, we start meddling with that. I think we're going to have start having our own existential problems that are going to draw our attention back to ourselves rather than messing with Israel. Well, maybe we just outsource it to the Haitian army or something like that. <laughs> all, all Tom, what do, you, Tom what do you think about this? I have, I'll just give mine briefly at the end okay. and I'll ask one of you guys to close in prayer and we'll wrap it up. I think it would, I think it would be a really bad idea and I don't see it happening, but I will say this. I, I don't know if it was you, John, or you, Pete, that I mentioned this too, but when I was in Israel, I was sitting at one of my meals and nobody's at my table with me for a few minutes. I'm talking with this guy next to me, next table over. He, he's an Israeli Jew. And we, we it, within seconds, we found out that we had completely opposing opinions. And uh, he loves Biden. And he said, the only way this is going to be resolved, I said, what happens the day after? He said, the UN has to come into Gaza and run it. The UN has to be the peacekeeper. This is disturbing to me. And Excuse I hate me, to... just a second. I have to. Okay, I had to do my own face palm there. Yeah. Go ahead. But you know, you you. This is a problem that Israel's had throughout their history, biblical history, secular history. They've looked to other nations or other leadership to bring them their security, and you you know what's going to happen the day after is very concerning, and we do know that there's some kind of covenant that's coming daniel chapter 9 but but that's still in the future but you look at gaza some something's going to happen and i don't know if israel's going to handle it rightly well so my thinking is and i will flesh it out more on sunday because i i know i promised these guys to cut them loose but i i continue to look at daniel chapter 9 and this this covenant make firm, confirm, gavar, or whatever the word is, which is sort of like with force, with strengthening. And I cannot discount, I thought this since 2016, when they had Resolution 2334, and if you want to know all about it, listen on Sunday, Resolution 2334, which was the first anti-Israel resolution that the U.S. did not veto at the Security Council, and Samantha Power was the UN ambassador there, and I will play part of her TV interview from 2002, where she made some very troubling things, and now it sounds like, and she's still around, you know, she's, I don't know, US AID director or something, and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if this Daniel thing is not so much this great thing where they have a signing ceremony like they did with uh, uh, Oslo on the White House lawn in 1993, but it is something that they're just, the force thing is they're going to shove it down Israel's throat. You're going to do this. And I, I can't discount that right now. So I'm just going to, I will talk about it on Sunday as I think it's, it's a possibility. Uh, can I, can I, just, I just throw something on there, John? Sure. Uh, Remember the last well, time. Well, as long that as that it's happened. good and you agree with me, then you can do it. Otherwise, no. <laughs> <laughs> the last time that happened in what was it, December of 2015? What happened? 2016. Uh, Trump won. Tw well, Trump. Well, Trump, Trump had won, already right? won, though. That was when Obama was a lame duck. Yeah. Okay, that's true. That's true. But but okay, but listen, say. Pete. We have an election in November, and Obama. Oh, Biden, I call him oh, Biden, is in office until January. So if Trump wins in November, it's, it's going to be chaos. Just trust me. It's 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 the legal stuff. It's it's insane. I, I'm so troubled with what's going on in America. Um, but so we're going to have a, the same scenario, right? We have the oh, Biden administration in charge until January 20th. And it didn't stop Obama in 2016. Why would it stop him eight years later from doing something very anti-Israel at the UN to kind of shove this down Israel's throat? That's just, that's my concern. 
Um, and, you know, we, we do provide weapons to them. I agree with people like Caroline Glick that says, this, you know, the U.S. or Israel needs to get away from the, relying on the U.S. for anything. And I think that has prophetic implications, too. But, uh, well, anyway, guys, this uh, went by way too fast. And uh, in about, uh, I can't remember if we decided yet on April 9th or 10th, we're going to do a technology prophecy roundtable, Tom and I and Britt and... Scott Townsend and Patrick Wood is going to join us. And that'll probably be a couple hours. Uh, and that's going to be April 9th or 10th. Just watch for notice on that. And uh, I'm going to ask Britt to close us in a word of prayer. Uh, listen, I know that all this ends very well for us, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be some rough spots uh, between here and there. And I thank all of you for listening. There will be articles and links in the show notes along with some of the links to people that are participating today where you can find them. And Britt, why don't you just close us up in a word of prayer? Sure. Lord, we just thank you for bringing us together today and this technology, the ability for people in four different locations to speak with so many people all around the world. And we just hope that this has glorified you and turned people to your word. And we've talked a lot of, about a lot of things that have to do with Bible prophecy. And we just hope that everybody out there knows that the essence of that prophecy is to point to Jesus Christ. And so if there's anybody out there who's lost, who doesn't know Jesus, we pray that you will use this to open up their heart so that they invite Christ into their life so that he can transform them. <coughs> Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we just pray that as many people as possible can come to know him. So we thank you for this time, and you alone we pray. Amen. Thank you, Britt. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, as I said, check the show notes. I'll get those edited and up pretty soon. And uh, pay attention. There's a lot of things going on, and I think that it's going to be uh, – pretty wild ride between now and then. Thanks. Guys. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to end the stream now. Thank you.